Hello, how are you guys doing today? Kind of weird. Hi, welcome back, students, and I pray that you've been well and uh, keeping yourself safe and secure. And a lot of you have to work, and and so be careful as you go out there. And we're definitely praying for you. And uh, since we're here, so far away, but yet so close, I encourage you to continue to respond and, and to say hello. I want to see you on Popoli as we grow together, move forward together. And so today we're going to just be talking about the effects of philosophy on the Bible. It's hard to believe that we got four weeks left. I believe it is in class. And so I want you to stay consistent. It's the 31st of March and we're going to keep growing. And I really pray that these online classes is uh, I'm learning to edit even better and be able to allow you to just respond and see something visually. But I want you to continue to grow, uh, continue to let us know how you're doing and we'll work with you. You, you can contact me anytime uh, and we'll be here to serve you and to love you. Continue to keep Moses and, and Maggie and, and Pastor Larry in your prayers. They're beautiful people. And the reflection is my la- my laptop. It's right there. And definitely it's pretty bright in my arms. But I just want you to keep moving forward. And that's the most exciting part about this is we grow together. We get to know so much more about God's love and uh, his grace and his mercy. So... Let's pray, and we're going to get started with a wonderful class, and I'll give you the introduction, and we'll move forward from there. Father, we thank you, Lord. Just bless this class and bless our students, Father, and protect them, provide for them all above all ask or think, and be with our Bible college. And may we not be discouraged, but may we have hope in you, to praise and to love you. So bless them, bless the students, bless this class, Father, and speak to us now that we may understand what you're saying to us and what we see in our society today. We praise you, Lord. We love you. Stand strong, Father. Allow us to stand strong as we trust your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, for a multitude of times since the beginning, there's always been the attack on our Christian faith. And and it's always been an attack on the God and who he is, uh, the nature of God, I forgot to close my window, but we'll be okay. The nature of God and then the inerrancy of Scripture and attacking the Bible. And yet as as we've been reading and from God to us and as we've seen the Bible and how they compiled it, there's been attacks on whether we don't believe anything of the Jews but only of the Gentile writers, uh, uh, Paul's epistles. And so there's always been these attacks on the Bible. But for us as Christians, we love the whole Word of God and we studied how it was brought together. But yet, even today, 2,000 years later, the Word of God has always stood true. Jesus' words to us has always been the same, the stand strong. And so I want you to continue to grow and to study. That's why the book, I know it was a little bit on the large side, but man, is it a wonderful book to allow us to grow, to know so much more about who God is and his word and so it's a really beautiful book and an introduction to allow us to grow continually in his word and so with that the effects of philosophy because the challenge of today isn't so much of uh you know god oh it's there does god exist exist or does he not exist but the biggest challenge today has been now is the word of god the inspired word of god Is it what it says it is? And those have been the challenges. Because they couldn't, a lot of times, the old philosophers, the philosophers, well, maybe God exists. There's some out there that say there is no God. But I always crack up on, you would spend a whole lifetime, you get your degrees, your education, just to try to disprove God. And you haven't really accomplished anything. But the evidence of trying not to dis, the evidence of trying to disprove something means it it is there it exists but you just don't want people to believe it and so that's what we have same way with the cults the cults is to change the view of historical christianity to change your view of how you look at the bible and history to allow them to come alongside and yet this is what we have with philosophy today you know i don't mind the, the political system and that's fine you have your democrats your republicans and 
You have everybody else in between. But there's a big challenge today with the church. And you're starting to see a little bit of today, especially as the church is closed down. Oh, we see the diseases. We see that's out there, and so you got to stop for a moment. But what I'm talking about, you guys, is the effects of philosophy and this progressivism. Progressivism is not so much a, a political view as it is a religious system. And that's what we wanted to talk about today. Especially when it comes to apologetics and how I have to attack the Bible. I have to attack your word to discredit it so that a new truth, because the Bible is 100% truth. We can believe the Bible. We can trust God's word because it's the infallible word of God. It stands the test. In the beginning was the word, oh, this infinite logos. This logos of reason, this logos of ethics. So it's logos of logic. But it was the ultimate logic. You see, remember, what is the law of logic? The law of logic, philosophically, is that there's no, it's the law of no contradiction. So you would have a logos, God, that does not contradict himself. You have a word that does not contradict itself. And for a word to not contradict itself, it must be timeless. And that's the most beautiful part of the word of God. In Matthew, it says this in 12, uh, 43 to 45. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places, seek and rest and find none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And then he comes and finds it empty, swift and put in order. Then he goes and he takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man, which is worse than the first. And so shall it be with this wicked generation. And what we see here, an attack on God's word, an attack on truth. And so we want to give a little history of that to understand how we got to that place where we're at today. I got a couple books here that I'll show you through as we go through. But the first one is interesting. This is the Da Vinci Code. And the Da Vinci Code is anywhere you can find this book. Any used lending li any used library. Right? You'll find seven, five, ten. You'll find a bundle of them out there, one or two. But pick yourself up one of these. And when you pick one up, you can study it. It's really quite interesting. And as you read these books, because this is a number one bestseller. And so so many lies have come from here that you can read these for yourself. One of them is, uh, I'll read it to you. In page 234. Because G Constantine upgraded Jesus' status almost four centuries after Jesus' death, thousands of documents already existed chronologizing his life as a mortal man. You see, this is what they're turning around telling you. Jesus wasn't God or the Christ until Constantine. That's four centuries later. Excuse me, three centuries later. This lie of attacking Jesus. You see, he says in the book, nobody is saying Christ was a fraud or denied that he walked the earth and inspired millions to better lives. All we're saying is that Constantine took advantage of Christ's substantial influence and importance. And in doing so, he shaped the face of Christianity as we know it today. Is that true? What have we studied in history? Listen, Constantine commissioned and financed a new Bible, which omitted those Gospels that spoke of Christ and human traits and embellished those Gospels that made him godlike. The earlier Gospels were outlawed, gathered up, and burned. It's interesting to note, he said Langdon added, anyone who chose the forbidden Gospels over Constantine's version was deemed a heretic. Is that true? What have we studied? And so these are the things that I'm sharing with you, the attacks on the scriptures. And think about this, how many people are reading these? And page, uh, where are we at here, forgive me? One page earlier. So it had to be 231, it said this. The Bible is a product of man, my dear, not of God. The Bible did not fail, did not fall magically from the clouds. Man created his historical record in tumorous times. It has evolved through the countless translations, editions, revisions, 
History has never had a definitive version of the Bible. And it said this, more than 80 Gospels were considered for the New Testament, and yet only a relative few were chosen for inclusion. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Is that true? What is your argument? What do we know from that? What do we see that we can understand this? That's why it's important. And so many others inside here that were attacking the scriptures. And I want you to check. Is there, listen, if I can find it here. Forgive me, here it is. And page 256 talks about a Q document. And yet, is it there? Because it says the Vatican admits and they believe it exists, but yet it's not there. And so you do the study, you do the research. So these are the things that I'm sharing with you. This is what attacks Christianity. And because the ultimate truth of Christianity, and because it's been attacked, how is it now played out? How is the Bible played out for you and for me? Because I'm attacking the people that haven't done their study. Just as Jehovah Witness. Oh, they look for sincere people. I tell you one thing. You never met an unsincere Jehovah Witness. They're all sincere. But in their sincerity, they're deceived. You see the difference? They want to know God. They want to discover the truths of God. But because of an organization created a cult to deceive many. That's what A.W. Tozer writes. He says this, that almost everything wrong with the society of his day was due to the fact that as a nation we had been losing the knowledge of God. And that's exactly what it is with us. And we're going to study that. How did we lose our knowledge of God? What happened to the university system today? What happened to the thinking of people? Like I always say, this isn't your father's Democrats. This has completely changed. And that's what we're going to study. We're going to study the short attack. And that's where it takes us today. A, this is a short history of the humanistic attack on the Bible. You see, it attacks the Bible. It goes after, is it really God's word? Is it truly what it says it is? First, we must understand the historic humanist worldview. And we're talking about the atheist. We're talking about the pantheist. It's incredible how they lined up together because the humanist is, doesn't believe there is no God and the pantheist believes that the world is God. And so now we have this mother nature. It's not nice to remember the commercial with mother nature, mother earth. And so this taking away that we center away from the infinite to worship the finite. Second is an agnostic, and we're talking about this. First, we had the atheist, and then we have the pantheist, or even the polytheistic worldview of a God that is not personal anymore, but a God that is impersonal. God that is once infinite now comes into the finite. God who does not change becomes a God that does change. A God that is outside of time that becomes a God that comes inside of time. A God that is impassable, has feelings, but they're unchanging feelings because he's infinite. He knows the beginning from the end. He dwells in one eternal presence to a God that is now passable, that he's moved and he's this bipolar God. These are the things that we have to understand. So the question we must ask is this, you guys. Where did this view come from in history? And how has it affected the Bible and the church? And so we have to understand this verse, as see, you see. The attacks on God were not moving the followers of Christ. Man, it don't matter what people say about the Bible. I've done my history. I've done my reading and my research. But you know what? The followers of Christ... Man, we're secure. Just like a good marriage. Man, I don't have to worry about my salvation. I'm an abiding Christ. I'm abiding in this what's called a theocracy. 
I'm governed by God. In my marriage, I want it to be governed by God. And I want to be in a church that is governed by God. I want it to be in order. I always say, all churches are perfect. It's a people that can screw it up. Let your denomination, you let your traditions come in and affect the word of God, you'll suffer. Man, I wanna be in a church that just says, let's just teach the Bible. No contradictions, just enjoy the word of God. You see, so the attacks against the Bible started on the works of God. You couldn't, man, God exists. God wrote his law in every man's, man's heart. Oh, but let's deal with God. If we can change our view of God, if we can change your view of the Bible, now we can change your philosophy. And then we have the power of God. Why we study the attributes of God. These are the things I want you to remember. You see, that's why at the beginning, remember, at the beginning of our class, when you started, when you came into the class, our apologetics and the Bible, we studied all of the attributes of God. Well, a lot of them. Just so that we would get a clear understanding of what the Bible teaches. And by getting a clear understanding of what the Bible teaches, it allows us to be very effective. It allows us to know who God is, doesn't it? It allows us to see God, to trust in God, to who he is. So because of who God is, we know his word then is timeless. We know his word doesn't change. Yep, man's philosophy changes, but not God. So as we see D, some of the philosophers who held these views were either atheists, these new philosophers, these people all of a sudden started changing, held a religious worldview that they were famous pantheists. Who were these people? Barack, uh, uh, it's Barack Espinoza, David Hume, uh, George Hegel, Karl Marx, uh, Frederick Engels, Immanuel Kant, Soren Kierkegaard, Charles Darwin, uh, Nietzsche, John Dewey. And these are some of the people that we're gonna look at. Because our class is only an hour and a half, but two hours. You know, we gotta try to fit it in there with your thoughts and thinking in there. But this is what I want us to study. Norman Geiser says this, destructive biblical criticism is not the result of factual finds, but of philosophical fallacies. It springs not from history, but from philosophy, from the, from the philosophies that are alien to the realistic theism present in scripture. You see that? The fallacies, they're alien. They're not lining up with scripture, like the Dead Sea Scrolls as we talked about before in previous classes. No, these fallacies were outside, trying to incorporate them into the Bible. So when we look at these people, the first one we want to look at is, is, is Baraj Espinosa. And this was in, you see your notes on there, number one. He was a Portuguese Jewish philosopher, which is really quite interesting. Because think about, here he looks at God and go, how do I deal with God? And is is Jewish? I don't even consider the New Testament now. But here's this genius man, and oh, he was very smart, very intelligent man. He lived from 1632 to 1677. Now we're talking about the 17th century. We're the 21st century, think about that. And so he was born almost 400 years ago. And he says this, when you get a little photo of it, you'll be able to see that. Some of the earliest texts on the Bible were from Spinoza, who attacked the God of miracles. And that's the first thing, you see, I didn't want to disprove God, but did God really create the earth in seven days? Or actually six days and rested on the seventh day. Did God really part the Red Sea? Was there really a Moses that came against Pharaoh with 10 plagues? Did the Jordan River really did cease so that Joshua and them can cross? You know, these are all the things that we have to ask ourselves. But these were the challenges from him. 
And some of the earliest attacks, like I said, were from Spinoza that attacked the God of Miracles. He wrote his book, listen, this book, The Anti-Supernaturalism, whose influence even today has affected a majority of teachers, college professors, and philosophers worldwide, even till this day. This man lived almost 400 years earlier. Even I have a copy of his book, his writings, his philosophy. You see, he stated in his book, said this, that nothing then comes to pass in nature in violation of her universal laws. Nay, everything agrees with them and follows from them, for she keeps a fixed and immutable order. You see that? Then he goes on, he says, in fact, he says, a miracle, whether in violation to or beyond nature, is a mere ab absurdity. It's impossible. It's impossible that the Bible is correct on this. And so he goes after it because it's fixed by natural laws. You can't change the natural laws. Always 24 hours a day. Gravity always pulls the same. And so we started attacking. There's no way that God would have done these things. So he didn't go after God wasn't real. He went after, are the scriptures true? And it's impossible to violate the, the immutable natural laws. Therefore, miracles are impossible. If materialism is true, then there is no God. Now, See, once I go after the natural laws, once I go to discredit the Bible, now I can start weighing heavily on God. Then there's no heaven, no earth, no hell. Nothing supernatural. You see, now he's really starting to challenge everything. That's exactly what we were talking about. I need to go after the Word. I need to challenge the Bible. You see that? Then... The Bible needed to be rethought of. It needed to be rethought of in the light of this new truth. You see, I had to start looking at the Bible differently. I had to start taking a look at those things that challenge the validity of Scripture. You see that? How do we challenge him? He said this because he was even looking at the New Testament. A demon possessed of Scripture becomes a madman. And then Jesus could not have really risen from the dead. But his disciples merely believed that he rose from the dead. Did Jesus really rise from the dead? Did the original apostles or disciples write the Bible? And so on and so on. I mean, that's what those questions now become. You see, I'm not saying the Bible isn't there. We all have a copy of it. The number one bestseller. But I can question now. Is the Bible valid? And this rethinking of Scripture, listen, was the beginning of the higher or the historical criticisms of the Bible. Remember we talked in that a couple weeks ago. It's probably three, higher criticism and lower criticism. Lower criticism is studying the words of the Bible. Higher criticism, higher criticism can be said historical criticism, but it deals with the area, it deals with the time and the people. It deals with, is this truth, do we find the substantial truth for it, the facts? There's a great book on it here that, that goes with it. One of my favorite books, and I'll show it to you. I think I showed you last week on higher criticism, and it's Etna Lineman. If you get the chance to get this book, the read it. This was a lady that was a scholar. She's a professor, and she was under uh, uh, Butterman, and that he was a professor, a genius man, but he, he was a liberal. But she writes about how she got saved and goes after what he had been saying. You see that? And so it's really incredible. You can read this book. There's so much to read in here. I wouldn't know where to start. But. Um, and I love what she says here. And just to be able to know, to study him, take a look at this book, get the chance. Use your little, uh, uh, your, your, these things, what they call them, tabs. So we can see that here. So this rethinking, this higher criticism now. Hey, if I can't find it, if there's no proof or evidence of it, 
then how do we believe it? And this becomes the attack on Scripture. Number two, then. From Spinoza became the Scottish skeptic David Hume. He lived from 1711 to 1776 in his little photo. He was he writes, listen, using Spinoza's anti-supernaturalism worldview, only way less objectionable to the modern views of Christianity and philosophy. See, he so he takes his book, Spinoza's anti-supernaturalism, this view. And so he's going to write, you know what? I want to stay more, you know, balanced. Don't want to hurt anybody's feeling. I don't want to use anything that's objectionable. I don't want to go after anybody. I just want to write and let us think about it. He writes a book. In his book, I have the book on my shelf. I should have grabbed it. He writes in his book, Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding in 1748. See, now the time, another 50 years has gone by. Hume launches his attack on miracles. Remember what I said? You attack miracles, and then I can attack God. If I can attack that the Word of God is not true, then I can attack the Bible of the Word of God. And this is what he does. His attack on miracles first, and then on the Bible, and then on God. Miracles are a violation of the laws of nature. There we are dealing with natures again. There's a book that's really quite interesting called by William Pauli, and it's called Natural Theology. And there's a lot of great professors and scholars that can get your theology books who write about natural theology. So it's important to get the right ones, be careful what you read, and just enjoy them. But miracles, number one, are a violation of the laws of nature. So as he attacks it, he gives us a list. Firm, he says this, miracles are in a violation of the natural, the laws of nature. They go, I don't understand them. I can't comprehend them. And because I can't understand, doesn't mean then they're not evident. Boy, imagine these men, you try to define them what cells are and diseases. You know, that's for another subject, another time. And then he said, number two, firm and an alterable experience has established these laws of nature. You see the proof of them. So violation of laws, number one, and then experience is established. Number three, a wise man proportions his beliefs to the evidence. Therefore, the proofs against miracles is an entire is as entire as any argument from experience can possibly be imagined. Okay? God, show me a miracle. If you're real, show me you're real. Let me see a shooting star. I want to see a miracle. Lord, I'm going to break my finger, and I want you to heal it right now. Hmm, nothing happened. He probably walked around with a broken finger. No, he didn't do that. But that'd be classic. You can see what I'm saying. Because he didn't see the evidence. He hasn't, what, trusted. The evidence, so he, he doesn't believe it. So then the God of the Bible, this Trinitarian monotheistic God, has now become, because this is an attack, an impersonal limited being, a pantheist, who follows the natural laws of the universe, what? Neo-Orthodoxy, postmodernism, panantheism that we have today. And we talked about those uh, seven worldviews just a little bit. Remember the seven worldviews? Uh, what is it? Atheism, finite godism, pantheism, polytheism, panantheism, deism, and uh, mo uh, monotheism. But then you would have a Trinitarian monotheistic. Two different views, isn't it? Uh, the Jews were monotheistic. Muslims are monotheistic per se. Uh, Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses would be polytheistic. And Christianity are Trinitarian monotheistic. So that's eight views but seven monotheistic, two views of that. So that's just for another subject. So those are really quite interesting. Attacking God now. See, once I go after the Bible, once I go after God's word, and then I can go after God. Norman Geiser, Norman Geiser says this. The results of if Hume's philosophical naturalism have been disastrous for Christianity. 
His friend uh, James Hutton, as you'll read on, he lived from 1726 to 1797, applied Hume's anti-supernaturalism to geology, integrating nearly two centuries of naturalism, inaugurating, excuse me, nearly two centuries of naturalism in science, taking this view that the Bible is in truth, dealing with trying to separate what science is. Remember, Christianity, biblical, the Bible is a science. And there's a multitude of science. But one of the fun ways people always say to me, Christianity, there's, it contradicts science. Oh, no, it doesn't. The Bible uses science all the time. Or oh, really, what science is that? Let me give you a fun fact. It's the science of, uh, man, I got senile. Forgive me. Oh. Excuse me. If you're my student, you know what I'm trying to say. But it is the science of, of when someone dies, what do they call it? Come on, come on, help me. Uh, when someone dies, they have, uh, um, well, anyways, my mind just went blank on that. I'm getting old, but you know what I'm trying to say to you. When someone dies and then I have to do research on his body and then I'm trying to pick the bugs out and I don't know how long he's been dead. And then um, the science of, my Lord, that's okay. I know I'll put it in there and I'll make it across. I'll, I'll scribe it across when I put the video in there and uh, I'll get that to you. But it's in the click to my head because all of a sudden I went bla blank and now I can't remember a thing. But we'll get there. And when it pops on my head, I'll shout it out to you. But I know I'll put it in Forensic science. Forgive me, you guys. Forensic science is the science that Christianity used, the Bible uses through archaeology. So that's one of them, but we can go on. And uh, But that's just for right now. Norman Geisler said this, and that's, I think we read it. Then from the writings of Spinoza and David Hume, it affected this scholar. And this is what I'll share with you. His name was David Strauss. And I have uh, a volume two here for you to see. And David Strauss writes this, and it's interesting. It's a two volume set. And so he wrote the first anti-supernaturalist and pantheistic view of the life of God, the life of Christ. It's a two volume set on the life of Christ. And this German affected because these were the books that became the use of reasoning in the German universities the German seminaries. And so this became the standard work. Oh, it wasn't. G. Campbell Morgan was incredible. And if you ever get the chance, you can get the teachings of the Christ. Man, the great physicians by Christ, by G. Campbell Morgan. These are just other studies, and I'm looking for my famous one, the one that I love the most, and uh, my glasses don't have them on. But it's the crisis of the cross. The crises of the Christ. Three great books because there's other ones though too to get. And you can get one of my favorites here that I have. And if I can find it, I'm blind as a blind as a bat. But I knew it was here before. And uh, forgive me. I don't remember. Uh, maybe I gave it away. But it's the incomparable, incomparable Christ by uh, J. Oswald Sanders. And it is just a phenomenal work on the life, on the life of Christ. Sorry about that, I got my right back to you. Anyways, but he writes this book that becomes the scholar work for theologians in Germany. And now you start to understand that our, our scholars in America were very sound beautiful men, but we started sending them for greater education, we thought, in Germany. And as they got to, went to Germany, they got indoctrinated. Man, even scholars today go into Germany. William Lane Craig is, man, I love William Lane Craig. I read his books, I enjoy his videos. But he writes now that God came into time. How much it influences somebody. And he was a student under Norman Geisler. Yet higher education of reading the wrong books. 
Nothing wrong with reading the wrong books. I love reading. I got a library, stack of library on philosophy, the cults, Jehovah Witnesses, a huge section on that. Mormonism, different religions that I teach on. But I know what I believe. I know what I believe. And now he's struggling with the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Were they metaphorical? Do we believe in evolution, creation, evolution? These are the thoughts today. And this is how Strauss had affected a society. And then other scholars that were affected by the Butterman, um, Paul Tillich, Carl Barth, among others that have influenced thousands of professors and, and Bible teachers, Christians, maybe the millions. You can always see it as anytime you grab a work, I always want to, if any work that I grab, This is um, Louis Burkhoff. I mean, he's, he's a Calvin type of uh, professor, but I enjoy reading the Calvinist. But you can see how much of he talks about here when you go into the back in your index that these people, authors, that have affected Karl Barth. And he gets a whole section on it. You can see this on the index if you can see that there. So you want to be able, when you buy a book, Open it up and go to the index. As you go to the table of contents, you're going to go to the index to see if if they quote these scholars a lot. Bart Buttleman, and we can go on, Bueller. I mean, there's so many of these liberal scholars that you have to be careful what you're reading. That's always interesting, isn't it? You see. But I read it because it allows me to get, I love both sides of an argument. It allows me to learn both sides of an argument. But we've seen what Strauss had done. It became the standard, like I said, in universe seminars. The result has been destructive, the destruction of biblical history. You see, particularly the miraculous history recorded in scripture. And then we have George Wilhelm Hegel. George Hegel now, as we've seen. And yet, you know what, is that his work that he did on the the, phenomena, the phenomenology of the spirit and his encyclopedia of philosophy, that these works that he did. And Hegel taught historical progressivism and what became known uh, through the, the misinterpretation of uh, Fitch's Hegelian dialecta. You see, Hegel created this concept, he had this concept that he got of, of thesis, antithesis, synthesis. And so, but it became a misinterpretation of Finch that said it was, Hegel had defined it and he called it a Hegelian dialecta. But it's not like that. But you know what? I've read scholars, Christian scholars, that called it a Hegelian, Hegelian dialectic. And it's wrong. I won't say anything. But it's quite interesting how we can get traditionally caught up in things. And yet we always... It's like the word Jehovah. Jehovah is not a Hebrew or a Greek word. You see, it's from the Latin. And even then, it was just the, the J was added. And this, wasn't, well, this word wasn't founded until uh, it was the 13th century. And yet, that's tradition. So it's always interesting when you see those things, you know, that, oh, well, the ancient Jehovah word, Jehovah. No, it's not an ancient word at all. But that's just things that happen. Anyways, that's for another subject, another lesson for you. So, in matter of fact, in the, um, the Da Vinci Code, let me see if I can find it. Uh, I'll show you something kind of funny. Let me see if I can find it here. Here it is right here. He says, the Jewish the, the Yahweh, the sacred name of God, is in fact derived from Jehovah, you see? Like I said, it's just the funniest things you read. This is page 309. You can take a look at that for yourself. And um, there's so much here. And you know, That's for another time. Shekinah, the females and stuff. That's for another study. But Hegel taught this view. And so it literally became that, okay, here's God. And we look at God as the infinite God. 
Now that's our, our thesis right there. How do we define God? So then our antithesis would be then, well, wait a minute. If I define God as the Almighty, then my conclusion is that I have an Almighty God. But if I define God as, well, God is my, my thesis, but then my antithesis that God is not a God of miracles anymore. God is a God that is impersonal. God is a God, you see what I'm headed to? That he can't even hold his word is not truth anymore. That how do, what is my conclusion of who God is? Remember the synthesis. That's the, your answer. Then. That's why I shared with you guys how important it is to understand what? These three words. Remember we talked about them? Univocal. Excuse me. Equivocal, right? Univocal. Exactly the same. Equivocal. Complete opposite. Or analogical. How do we define God? God is similar to his creation. God is an infinite love. We're a finite love. I mean, and so on and so on. God is infinite justice, righteousness. He wants his creation to be justice. He wants his creation to be righteous. You see, that's the beautiful part about God that we can see. So Hegel taught this. And yet, is he defined in God? Is he didn't define and so although Marx is, listen, Karl Marx now says that although Marx's sense of history's uh, destination was opposed to Hegel's, yet he didn't have the same view. Marx built his philosophy from the basic structure of he Hegel's dialectic. You see that? So from this view, Karl Marx famously called religion what the opiate of the masses. Can you believe that? It's an addiction. To have uh, this God is... Because he's not real, he's just an addiction created by man to have something to worship. Man must worship something. If I don't worship God, then I worship money, material things. I worship other men. And so this is exactly what we had. But nevertheless, Hegel did claim that history, listen, is the unfolding of absolute spirit and the developmental dialectic. The result of this so-called Hegelianism has been, for biblical scholarship, disastrous. You can do everything with it. Uh, mediating would, has came from this also. Because of this, F.C. Bars contended that the Gospel of John, listen, because the evidence wasn't there, must be viewed as a second century synthesis. Yeah, the Gospel of John exists, but wait a minute, it was written in the second century. So what did it do? It dealt the same thing too with Peter and Paul. We don't find any of the early works. We find the earliest ones, third century, fourth century. So now the attack on Christianity is there. So we recognize these attacks. You see that? This conclusion was a ride with almost total disregard for the eternal and external evidence for the earlier first century dating. Because what we know was written there, but wait a minute. What is the evidence? What do we only have right now? Oh, now we find what? Books have come out. Remember we have it up there? Uh, the 38 volume set. And the early church fathers. We have it in your book. Where is our book? I think it's in my bag. Of, uh, man, from God to us. So these conclude, th these conclusions exegetical. However, massive and scholars are largely determined by prevailing philosophy. All of a sudden, whatever we thought we had, well, wait a minute, let's take a look at it. Philosophy can become the standard. And it was Hegel, who was the original author, who wrote, listen, that God was dead. My gosh, by studying God's dead. And that takes us then to uh, the father of modern existentialism, number four, would be Soren Kierkegaard, 1813 to 1855. Now, Soren Kierkegaard, this theologian here, he was a poet, a Danish theologian, a religious author, who was widely considered to be the first existential theologian and philosopher. 
What is existentialism? Remember, it's in a movement of philosophy and literature that emphasizes individual existence, freedom, and choice. It is based on the view that humans define their own meaning in life and try to make rational decisions despite existing in an irrational universe. You see that? His view, his division of fact and value has been biblically disastrous. Because what he did was existential and was to remove absolute truth of the scriptures. That there is no absolute truth. From his own frustrations, his own broken heartedness. Kierkegaard inspired, uh, uh, inspired beliefs that religious truth is a personal encounter or is subjective. You see? Subjective means the quality of being or influence by based on personal feelings. It's subjective, taste and opinions. So all truth is subjective. It depends on you and me. You know, it's an old argument for that. There is no absolute truth. It's all subjective how I do it. So your answer to that is, is that an absolute statement? That there is no truth? See, because now when you have ultimate truth, there it is. That's not a contradiction. That's what logic is, the law of no contradiction. So for me to turn around and tell you, listen, I don't believe the Bible. I don't believe there's a God. I believe in subjective truth, and there's no such thing as absolute truth. And you're going, is that an absolute statement? I'm all, ooh, it's been funny. I've used it many times. It's a classic argument. So it's really fun. Take a look at it and try it sometime with somebody. This is what Kirk and Guardian philosophy is. Ain't that something? Because if you've been to the colleges, and I know a lot of you had, you dealt with people with this, trying to deal with this truth. Through experience that supersedes the absolute truth this philosophy did, this existentialism. The absolute truth of the Bible. You see that? Supersedes it. So now we get these propositional truths. Propositional truth, a statement, assertion that expresses a judgment of opinion which is not essential to faith. That's how we start looking at God. God is one way to heaven because, well, you know, we can look at other things based on my feelings or experience. That's where higher criticism is. We came in there. Higher criticism doesn't affect real Christianity. But what did it do to those that were studying? Affected by professors that would uh, deceive. God is the holy other. Unknowable, unpersonal God becomes. You see, because if God is not a personal God, then he's impersonal. So I took in the infallible and made him fallible. I took the infinite and made him finite. I took the personal God and made him impersonal. And so you can see what we were talking about from the beginning. From Kierkegaard's philosophy, he became the father of existentialism. The thing is to find the truth, he says, which is true for me, to find the ideal for which I can live and die for. Let me find a truth that's good for me. And interesting is that he wrote 1835 in his journals. And now here we are today, Almost 200 years later, in this philosophy, as we see it running wild with this utopia. After the Second World War with existentialism, atheist, humanistic, socialistic approaches to existentialism received a cult following among the European youth and has influenced intellectuals such as Barth, Brunner, and Butman and has affected the whole world since. Is that something? Everybody's saying, what happened to England? What happened to Europe? What happened to God? Here it was, this existential philosophy. They received this following of what is truth. Art and the Renaissance again. There's two words, and we'll deal with those another time. And I probably should have did a study on them for you or gave you a study on them that have been really enjoyable. And it's a, a, a priori and then a pastoria. And um, pastoriari, you know what I meant. Maybe I'll cut this out of the video. 
But these words, when one was experienced based on knowledge, on, on wisdom, and a pastoriori was based on what experience alone. These became, these two words became defined in the Renaissance and what we have today. So you can take a look at those. Can you see? Number five. So it's interesting. <clears throat> Before number five, is studying uh, Soren Kierkegaard's philosophy, how it affects, still go on today. Charles Darwin. Listen, Darwin concluded everything in nature is a result of fixed laws. He added, by further reflection, that the clearest evidence would be made necessary to make any sane man believe in the miracles by which Christianity is supported. Number two, that the more we know of the fixed laws of nature that we are dealing with natural law, the more non-credible do miracles become. That the man of that time were ignorant to a degree almost incomprehensible by us. That the Gospels cannot be proven to have been written simultaneously with the events, he says. That they differ in many important details. You see, because one of the Gospels said two witnesses, one said one witness. Well, because then they contradict. But I always love to tell you, remember, it's a football game. You vote for one team, I vote for the other team. Because I named all the players in your team and you won. Doesn't mean my team wasn't there. I just named the players on your team. And so we recognize these. But yet this is what, what happened with this reasoning. Far too important as it seemed to me to admit, he says, as the usual inaccuracies of eyewitnesses, by such reflections as these, I gradually came to disbelieve in Christianity as a divine revelation. Man, that was his attitude because he couldn't come up in his own reasoning of the Bible truths. Pretty tragic. The result of the philosophy of evolutionism has been catastrophic for biblical and theological studies. The history and the scientific accuracy of the Genesis record has been denied. The doctrine of creation has been discarded with serial moral consequences on our dignity and our in society. Hitler, for example, you guys be, applied Darwin's view of society with horrendous human consequences. Arguing this, he says, number one, if nature does not wish that weaker individuals should mate with the stronger, she wishes even less that a superior race should intermingle with an inferior one because in such a case is all her efforts. Excuse me. Hitler then went on to say such a, 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 pers a, a preservation goes hand in hand with the preordained law, he says, that it is the strongest and the best who must triumph and that they have a right to endure. And with that, Hitler slaughtered some 12 million human beings, which he considered to be inferior beings. Isn't that something? Taking Hitler's view. So as we've seen this philosophy, it takes us to Friedrich Nietzsche. And it's really quite interesting where we're headed to because we've seen the attack on the scriptures. We've seen the attack on supernaturalism. And that reminded me, there's a couple uh, uh, great books, Norman. Geiser has a book on miracles. Uh, C.S. Lewis has a book on miracles. I think they're on my shelf somewhere. I'll have to uh, get them for you. And uh, maybe I'll run, take a peek at them or something. But then you got to like search for them. I see up there where I'm at. But that's okay. We'll get it next time. But Nietzsche now, taking all these views, the anti-supernatural, Strauss's book, he took all of these things. And he brought it to create his philosophy. That's why it's so important. I always tell this to pastors. I tell this to you as leaders, as people in Bible college. Know what you believe. Build a foundation to what you believe. Study the books. Know your truth. 
because I always, always believe first impression is matters so much. What people hear first. That's why they're attacking our children with philosophy. They're attacking our children with views that affects them as they get older. So as parents, we have to be ministering to our children. We have to keep moving them forward in the right direction. And this is what Frederick Nietzsche, his influence, listen. He lived from 1844 to 1900, and he took the concept of God dead serious. Frederick Nietzsche A was radical it was a radical questioning the ethical values and objectivity of truth. Boy, I'm trying to pronounce these words, my dyslexic can kill me sometimes. As a result, as early as his uh, 1862 essay, Fate in History, Nietzsche had argued that the historical research had discredited the central teachings of Christianity. But David Strauss's Life of Jesus also seemed to have a profound effect on this young man. Remember what I shared with you? And in, in addition to uh, Ledwood's uh, Fernbox, the essence, the essence of Christianity influenced young Nietzsche with its argument that people created God and not the other way around. And it, it really quite interesting how we started viewing God, how he started viewing God, forgive me, so Nietzsche writes in his book later on, and let's see if I can pronounce it, uh, thus spoke, what is it, Zarathustra? Uh, and so uh, Zarathustra, it literally writes this book, and in this book, from this, um, he, this guy was a prophet, you know, a, a so-called prophet in Iran area, Iraq, in Iran, I believe it was, man. And, and there's a religion from this, uh, uh, Saratars, forgive me, trying to remember my brain right now, but that's all right. But he writes in this book, uh, Zaratusa, he writes his book, says, God is dead. God remains dead and we killed him. And that was Nietzsche's view. We killed God, taken from Hegel. Remember Hegel had said this almost 100 years earlier. And in Nietzsche's utterance, God is dead. His insistence that the meaning of life is to be found in purely human terms. So number two, Nietzsche said, we don't need God anymore. Man now becomes the measure. Man becomes the standard. And now we have an attack on Christian values that has affected millions today. Because this, remember Kierkegaard's philosophy, that truth is a matter of my opinion now. There is no absolute truth. Nietzsche said, if God is dead now because of what we studied, that there is no supernatural God, Strauss's book attacking God and Jesus, did Jesus really rise from the dead, as we said, is the gospel is true, all of these attacks, what did it take Nietzsche now? Man becomes a standard. So in his book, he introduces the Ubermunch to the death of Christ. The German word, the Ubermunch, is translated to English to mean the overman or the superman. Ain't that something? Man now becomes the standard. Thus, he says this, is that the, 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 the Zurathosel, he says this, the first announces the Ubermunch as the goal that humanity can set for itself. We can be what the overman. We can be the superman. Nietzsche introduces the concept of the superman in contrast to his understanding of the hope of heaven in Christianity. And it describes, see how the ancient Persian, the Persian prophet like uh, uh Zarathustra descended from his solitude in the mountains tell the world that God is dead and that the Superman, the human embodiment of the divinity is his successor. Nietzsche argued, he said this, that only the weak need to rely on the rules and the creation of others. Remember I said that to you? That God is the opium of the masses. This God, this addiction that man needs something greater self. But Nietzsche's trying to value his man. Being unique in nature should be able to generate his own rules and creations, provide he is powerful enough. Isn't that something? Here it was, 
I'm going to remove the Bible, remove God, and let allow man to be the standard. We have a right to our own fate. But if I think about this, to kill God, to kill the ultimate, the infinite, I have to create the finite. Now, man, remember I gave you three words earlier. Uh, it was uh, equivocal, complete opposite, univocal, com exactly the same, analogical, similar. So Nietzsche now looks at man as univocal. Man becomes the God. Man can become, look at Clark Kent, remember? Tip, type of Christ, isn't he? In a sense of, but for humanity. A type of Christ for the humanistic. That all of a sudden Christ becomes, or the Superman becomes the standard. He's what? Mild-mannered. Truth is discerned by his thoughts. Faster than a speeding bullet. You see that? The Uber Munch, the over, the over man, the superman. To be the future man as the hope of the earth. And encourages his reader to ignore those Christians who promise a relationship to mankind through the worship of God and a heavenly hope in order to call mankind away from what? The earth. So instead of calling mankind away of a hope of eternal life, I'll, I'll give them the life on earth. I'll give them the utopia. Isn't that something? Are you getting a picture here now? By going after the Bible, by attacking God, now I give man the earthly utopia. So Nietzsche's for the philosopher, the overman, was that the new man who would be a leader by example to humanity through an existentialist will to power that which was rational, irrational in nature. I'll give them something to think on their own terms. Nietzsche develops a concept in response to his view of the herd mentality, you see? The herd mentality and the inerrant nihilism of Christianity. The majority, the group. Don't we see that today? Think about that, the herd mentality. If enough people say it, it's got to be true. And if you go against the minority of whatever their views are, whether it is on gay marriage, being a homosexual, whether it's transgender, don't you see the attack on Christianity? To wipe out... Christianity because of its absolute truth and yet from Google to um, the bird Twitter to even uh, Facebook uh, to Instagram if you write things on there that contradict man the herd mentality what happens to you the herd mentality is that people can influence and adopt certain behaviors on a largely emotional rather than rational basis. People are moved that way. People are suckers. You go to a ball game. Man, hearing the people chair gets you excited to want to chair. You pick a team that others pick. Home crowd, home team is always, you know what I mean, the, the group. And so that's what becomes that's similar to type of a herd mentality. You attack people based on their views. And nobody wants to get attacked, so you don't say anything. You see that? And it can be replaced. The void of existential. That's a meaning that is rational, realized with the death of God. That's what this does. It replaces the void. It gives meaning to existentialism. So the superman... The Zubermunch emerges as the new meaning of the earth. A norm, a repundulating individual who overcomes himself and is the master in control of his impulses and passions. Isn't that something? That's what we see. That's what we have here. Man, this attack on Christianity, this attack on what we believe today. 
in Nietzsche's doctrine of the superman, the overman, and the will to power were all later twisted by Nazi intellectuals. David Hume said this, because even David Hume in his frustration, David Hume in his philosophy said this, when a man has no hope, it leads to delirium. When admit the state of the mind, this crazy disorder, and it leads to frustrations. You see that? Illusions, restlessness. And so man, how we need to recognize who God is. That's where it takes us till today. How the attack of the Bible like never before has been seen. Because why? We have social media. We have all of these crazy things in society today. Uh, cable TV, satellite TV, anywhere TV you have it. You have media news now. You have either conservative news or very liberal news that's going after. Philosophy, it's dealing with how you view the world. Look at our president and, and so what he goes through. Oh, you know what? I don't always support his character or his actions. But I tell you one thing, I'm no socialist. But this is what we have today. Even if he's trying to do right, because there's, see, there's a picture and I wish I had it here. And it's based on literally is that when Donald Trump came into office, he messed up this worldview of progressives that were introducing this to our society of a one world government. All borders are open. And he came and he went back and he changed it. And by that, all of the progressives are very angry. And that's what we're going to study today. We're going to look at this history of progressivism. We're going to look at its view. And so as we look at this philosophy of progressivism, listen, because at the end of the 19th century saw a rise in the movement through hostile and underlying principles to the nation's founding, the progressive movement. Progressivism was imported from Europe and would result in a radical break from America's heritage. In fact, it is best described as a counter revolution to the American revolution in which the sovereignty of the individual, natural law, natural rights, in a civil society that were built literally on a foundation of Judeo-Christian values and 2,000 years of enlightened thinking from it and human experience of the Word of God would be drastically altered and even abandoned for an ontological agenda broadly characterized as historical progress. This is where we're at today going after attacking the Judeo-Christian values. So I have to attack the Bible. I have to attack God. I have to have change your view of what a marriage is. And we see it in our society. So progressivism is the ideal of a confidence of historical progress and the perfectibility of man. This is what it becomes. In a self-realization through the national community or collective uh, uh, of collectionism of man, this emphasis on mental equality and social engineering. Ooh. It is the use, listen, of centralized planning in an attempt to manage social change and regulate the future development and behavior of a society. That's what socialism engineering is. They're changing, they're molding a society of people to way to think, to tell them what truth is, trying to create a utopia of no absolutes. That's the way that John Lennon's song is so huge today. Imagine, imagine no God, no heaven or hell, trying to create a utopia. And its instances on a concentrated, civilized, administrative rule led by various degrees of unrestricted governance. You know, that's interesting because as you look at what's going on in our society today with diseases, each state now is autonomous in a sense because they all govern themselves 
now you're trying to whatever watch wait until you see this what they're trying to do to our economical system moreover for progressives there is no absolute or permanent truth only passing passing and destined historical events thus even values are said to be relative to time and to circumstances there is no eternal moral order that's the attack in the bible that we've been looking at remember i told you this progressive movement you guys this is a religious ideology this socialism but it's views we base that this worship of man remember this pantheist that is what was true and good in 1776 and before is not necessarily true and good for today. The attack on the Bible. Consequently, the very purpose of Americans' founding is now what? Argued against, debased. And that's something. Now I have to question how America was founded. I'm going to try to change it. It was based on slavery. It was based on this. It was never based on religious freedom. It was, and now the attack on Christianity, the attack on what moral values. We need to change these. There's books out there on the history of America. Forgive me for not knowing the authors on that, but it's up to you to do your research also. To better understand this ideology, you guys, it's, refut it's a refutation, literally, of the American history, his attack on the American heritage. And it's enormous effect on the modern American life. And that's exactly what it's gone up against. It's gone against what you believe, and it's gone against what I believe, an attack on it. It is necessary to become acquainted, you guys, now because of this, with some of the most influential, progressive and intellectuals they are with others set the United States on this literally regretful course. It has set us on a way that we need to be aware of. The first one that we discover and read about is Herbert Crawley, who was uh, uh, in 1869 to 1930, was among the early leading academic and progressive thinkers. The better future, which Americans proposed to build, he says, is nothing if an ideal which must, in certain essential respects, must free them from their past. That was his view. Now this is before 1930 he writes this. So Americans must be prepared to sacrifice the traditional vision, even the traditional American ways of realizing it. Number three, so the American heritage and founding principles must be thrust aside if there is to be any human progress at all. This is what he wrote. Number four, the past must be dismissed as outmolded and obstructive, only slowing the pursuit of the utopia ends, for the past is unconnected to the present. So I must attack anything of value, anything that allows me to not to forget about the past, the freedoms that we receive, the Judeo-Christian value under attack, the scriptures and what they teach, to believe in ideology that affects everything. So this requires a far-reaching change in education, the culture, the American mindset, in particular, the sacred rights of the individual. Paramount under the Declaration of Independence order are said to be the old notion of individualism. Individualism. You guys know me. They must give way to a new individualism where the individual is, sub is subjected to the moral powers of the state in the name of the general will and the greater good. Now it sounds like socialism, doesn't it? Isn't that something? So, in other words, to attack the faith, to attack the Bible, we had to what? Usher it into the educational system. And this is exactly what he says. Some greater good. This takes us now to John Dewey. John Dewey, from 1859 to 1952, 
was among the foremost progressive thinkers. Dewey, like uh, Crowley, claimed that progressivism was, in essence, a science-based pragmatism. A. Dewey was a humanistic educational reformer whose ideals have continued to be influenced to the educational and social reform and the, even in the public school systems today. If you went to the American school system, you were part of Dewey's American system. This philosophy that he brought in. Dewey has been called the father, the father, excuse me, of modern American education, on which he has immense has had immense influence in the lives of so many of you and me. As a philosopher and a writer, he is closely identified with the philosophy of instrumentalism, also known as progressive or pragmatic humanism. Dewey's religious form of pragmatic humanism is this. Doing what works best, but may not be logically or morally correct, by the pragmatic view of truth, whatever works then is truth. Ain't that something? That's why I think about this. It was really President Obama when he came into office. That's for a subject in a few minutes. He comes in the office. And first thing he does is, before he makes any decision, let's take a poll on it. Let's see what truth the American people want. Let's see what direction they're headed in. So we will then guide them and direct them on their truth. But they must be influenced. And that's what we see going on today. Here are all the um, elements for religious faith that sh shall not be confined to any sect, class, or race. Such a faith has always been the common faith of mankind. And it remains to make it explicit and militant. Think about that. Through the American educational system, his views have influenced virtually every American in the 20th century. Dewey even signed the first humanistic manifesto and was a leader in the movement to turn education towards secular humanism. No wonder. And if you get the chance, you can find these. I found mine uh, used books or years ago. Man, and, and just reading about the humanist manifesto, number one and number two and in here, and this one is 1973, I believe it was. Uh, yep, 1973. And there's even a newer one. The Manifesto of Humanism. Man, these books are interesting to read. He signs this. A humanist. God is dead. What is absolute truth? There is no God. We need to take prayer out of schools. We need to take the Bible out of school. One nation under God. When was the last time you said the flag salute? Indivisible. Undivided. With liberty and justice for all. What happened to that? This is exactly what we're talking about. Like most progressive in his time, Dewey argued, listen, B, like most progressive in his time, Dewey also argued that there is no timeless absolute truth since all things are subject to change and even in their situation moreover Dewey was a stern critic of capitalism whoa and private property rights what does that sound like to you which he condemned as a relic of early American principles reinforced in current times by the political party structure in his 1930 book Excuse me. Now we're talking about 1930. Individualism, old and new, he writes this. Dewey acknowledges Marx's influence on him and progressivism. Remember, Karl Marx is the father of communism. I didn't get, we didn't do a lot of research because we wanted to move on, but I'm sure everybody knows about it. But Marx's influence on him in progressivism, he says this. The issue of Marx raised the relation of the economic structure to the political operations is one that actively persist, persist. In 1934, Dewey delivers the speech, The Future of Liberalism, in which he declares, The commitment of liberalism 
to experimental procedures carries with it the ideal of continuous reconstruction of the ideals of individuality and of liberty and their intimate connection with changes in social relations. Isn't that something? He goes after it. He attacks it. He goes after these things of looking people making money. Goes after and condemns uh, the greedy, the profit motivated society. Doesn't it sound like today? Think about that with progressivism. You have the they're one percent. Everybody's against the one percent. It's funny if if you're poor, you're against people that are richer. And if you're richer and, and a progressive, now you're against the millionaires. But then you had Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden now. Both are progressives. Socialist. Then what? Now you go up to the billionaire. <laughs> That's so funny. And here you got a millionaire talking about people with property and he has a lake house. It's a contradiction, the hypocrisy. That's what they were calling him out. But this religious ideology... This new revolution that you've been hearing in speeches lately. Progressive view is insistent on the need for radical change and its hope of establishing a socialized and cooperative economical order. Man, the government takes over the businesses. Interesting. That would forcibly distribute the means of life impartially that are the hallmarks of economic Marxism. Man, the money that the government was passing out this week, you and I are gonna get some of that. And now there's an anger, everybody should get some of it. And send it out, distribute, distribute of wealth. And how much are you hearing that the government needs to take over businesses? The, despite Dewey's rejection of religion and the supernatural, he by no means considers himself irreligious. He insists for the need for and the preservation of what? The religious. But what Dewey did insist on was that religion would be traditionally defined. He said this, it would be traditionally defined as involving belief in a supernatural beyond this life, being discarded as a religious attitude towards all life. He said this, I shall develop another con conception of natural, of the nature of the religious phrase of experience, one that separates it from the supernatural and the things that have grown up about it. I need to take man and separate him from this experience of the Almighty. Isn't that crazy? From the supernatural to the natural. From the heavenly utopia to the earthly utopia. And I shall try, he says this, to show, number four, that religion is a hindrance and that what is genuinely religious will undergo an emancipation when it is relieved of him, when it is pulled away, emancipated, changed, separated, ripped apart. That then, for the first time, the religious aspect of experience will be free to develop freely on its own account. Man, a religion of no absolute truth. You see it with communism and socialism. The church, the state church. When we went to China, there's only certain things you can do. You cannot mix with the people there. You have to go to your own. Uh, they have a state church for people that are visiting. They tell them what to teach. And now it becomes a pantheistic worship. That's what we have today. Everything is the basis of Mother Earth. Everything is the basis of cleaning up the earth, the environment, the ecology of the land, the trash, taking care of Mother Earth. Don't pull the oil, the enriches out of it. Let's go back to uh, some utopia of guardian living. Dewey's view of progressivism, one based, one based view, literally of socialism. Dewey's relativism is not is not total. Listen, his system has an absolute progress or achievement to it. Whatever works for socialism, for progress, 
is good and whatever hinders it then is evil. Remember in Hillary Clinton's book, 1996, she writes a book, It Takes a Village. It takes everybody to come together in cooperation. See, this isn't a new view. This is an old view. Bill, Hillary Clinton were the progressives. And it really does wake us up. It really allows us to see what is going on in our society. But I love what Margaret Thatcher said this. The problem with socialism, with progressivism, is that you eventually run out of other people's money, and that's what it does. Take from the rich, give to the poor, but you finally end up taking everything they have. The reason I ended with John Dewey is that even from 1930s, when John Dewey introduced a philosophy into the American school system, listen, it has taken until now for this ideology to reach its full potential and to literally brainwash the families and in our youth today. This is what it was. The cradle to grave. And indoctrinate them. We're going to talk about that. Because Dewey signs this Humanist Manifesto. Co-authored the first one. Going in to indoctrinate the school system with several Marxist front organizations. By the end of the 20th century, Leading secular humanists in the West could see the need to steer away from these inhuman means and the tragic ends of the Soviet Union, China, Warsaw. They seen things happening. So they toned the Marxist jargon down. We're going to talk about that. To subsequent, sub, subsequent, yeah, I don't know why my head says it and then my brain sees a bunch of S's. Manifestos. And redo. Uh, uh, their version of the controlling the people as something that can somehow coexist with the liberty of all people. How do we control you, but yet make you feel you have liberty? Oh man, we see that. Going after people, make them stay in them now, keep them down. Right in 1999, Paul Kurtz, the framer of the Humanist Manifesto 2 explained, the Humanist Manifesto 2 was released in 1973, listen, to deal with the issues that had emerged on the world scene since 1933. The rise of fascism, and that is a government system led by a dictator having complete control. Ain't that something? That's why they attacked Donald Trump. That's one of the things that crack up with me. Like I said, not a Trumper. But the pot was calling the kettle black. And he wasn't trying to dictate. But they were trying. That's what they know. They know fascism, fascism, fascism. And what were they trying to do? Man, gosh, this guy's a fascist. And here they were. Literally trying to deceive the people. Trying to tell them a president is something. And that's exactly what their plan is. They showed them that since 1933. They've seen what Marxism done, socialism's done. The defeat of the Second World War, the growth and influence, and the power of this Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, the Cold War, they've seen the defeat of that. But it's crazy in ideology when you reject God or humanism disguised. Something that the devil. What's the greatest deceit of the devil? The greatest deceit of the devil is to make you believe that he's not real. It's all the, what is it, the fictation of your imagination. I can't put words together half the time. But man, what is it showing us? So the human manifesto, number two, no longer defended the planned economy, but left the question open to alternative economical systems. Thus, it was endorsed by both liberals and economical libertarians who defended a free market. Also by social democrats and democratic socialists who believe that the government should have a substantial role to play in the welfare of society today. Is that something? Man, the Declaration of Independence would be large people, small government. The sovereignty of the American people is that we the people, we ran the government, the government worked for us. Remember, it's interesting, Joe Biden says, the guy at, at the auto plant in Detroit says, hey, you work for us. And Joe Biden says, you're crazy. I don't work for you. You work for me. Ah, progressivism, socialism. Dewey's manifesto 
called for a new world religion that would be a dynamic force for today that must be shaped for the needs of this age. This is exactly what we have. That's why I always share with you. Columbia University, the attack on the Bible. Columbia University was also where Fabian Marx's John Dewey was trained thousands, listen, thousands of professors, thousands of teachers in the progressive education. That's all I always share with you guys. I even put something up on Instagram, if you an Instagram person. Uh, I said, what? You got to study. John Dewey, Fabian Socialism, Fabian Marxist, Fabian this philosophy, and progressive movement, how it attacks Christianity. I shared that with so many people online. I met a man running for Congress and shared that with him. And nobody would say anything about the socialism for how long? You see what I'm saying? Interesting, the USSR, or old Russia, eagerly translated Dewey's um, uh, uh, pro-collective books and used them as their own educational systems. What did they do? They took what we did, and look at the indoctrination where they're headed. First, they were communists, got away from communism, and didn't work. But what's going on now that we see with the fascists? You see, interesting. Fabian Marx's society in the British Socialist Organization, whose purpose is to advance the principles of a democratic socialism. That's what it was. So in Fabian Socialism, is when you take an ideology, listen, and gradually advance reforms in an effort to make slow changes in democracies rather than a revolutionary overthrow. See, there won't be any anarchy. There won't be any destructive of rising up and killing of leaders. It would be a slow indoctrination. That's what we talked about, the cradle to the grave. It would start off with the kids. What are they doing to the kids today? Think about that. Trying to teach them sex education. Trying to pervert them. Trying to allow them, trying to allow you to do things. You see that? Think about this. Barack Obama attended Columbia University. And he studied one of the chief fountains of both Fabian and Frankfurt strains of Mar Mar Marxism, you guys. And as a political science major there, he learned the variations of what the, the Crowley and Proven uh, strategy, listen, it was a plan to increase the burden. Listen, this strategy that was planned, that Barack Obama knew, it was a plan to increase the burden of the public welfare system to create an overwhelming crisis in the evil capitalistic system. Think about what he did. And how he was trying to take, overload the economical system. Think about what's going on today. What we're trying to overload, giving everybody free medical. Man, are we that dumb to realize What's happened to our medical? I mean, it's that dumb to realize what the government's trying to do. That's why I share with you what's going on in our society today. Are we, are we trying to kill capitalism? Are we attacking philosophies? There's a wonderful book, and I forgot to grab it. If I can see it, I can spot it, and then I'll grab it. It's, I know where it's at on my shelf. I just don't have my glasses on. But um, I think I'll have to get it for you another time. But um, it's, uh, give me one second, one second. When you go to school for higher education at Columbia University, one of the great books when it comes to political and educational system at Columbia University. That's a fact. You can look it up for yourself. And this is the book by John Dewey called Democracy and Education. See, I'm not making this stuff up. This is the book that's still in print. This is still a book that's used by kids today for higher education at Columbia University. 
and it deals with subjects as you study the table of context. Let me give you, read something to you. If I can find it here. The knowledge, study, uh, thinking, experience. Ah, oh, forgive me, forgive me. I knew what I wanted to say. But anyways, something interesting. Forgive me, you guys. I didn't mark it down. I should have had it marked. And my thoughts were so much that I read. So here it is, the burden, the economic system, and the cause, the rise of a Marxist-inspired government that would end poverty by the forceful redistribution of wealth. Whoa, wait a sec. I'm not making this stuff. Listen, the classic thing is, I've been teaching this class I've been teaching on this subject for almost 10 years now, on this philosophy. Dewey did much to adopt progressive education to what he had learned. According to reliable educator Samuel, uh, looks like Bumminfield, Dewey was first to shift the emphasis from language-based learning to hands-on basket-weaving type curriculum of progressive education. Does it blow you away? In his book, The Marketing of Evil, Internet editor David uh, Cupperland warns that the public school system has been cultivated to indoctrinate, to mold, and to socialize children. Isn't that radical? This is what I've been taught to do. Indoctrinate them. Brainwash them. Drive them crazy. Isn't that something? Let me read it to you again. In this book, The Market of Evil, David Kupalin warns that the public school system has been cultivated to indoctrinate, to mold, and to socialize children. That's exactly what it came from John Dewey's education. So I want you to understand this. This is not a new philosophy. As we read, this is an old philosophy. And that takes us to, it's really quite interesting, is... The cultural Marxism or the progressive of the Frankfurt School. In the 1930s, a group of professors at the Institute for Social Research at the University of Frankfurt in Germany, literally the Frankfurt School for short, developed their own unique strands of Western Marxism. While they preferred to call their theory the critical theory of society, their work has become more commonly known as cultural Marxism. In harmony with Marx, these Jews had come from, from Germany, but they what happened, Hitler was, getting, was attacking the Germans, we know about this, the Nazis were coming up, rising up against the Jews, and a lot of educators got out. These were the group of them also, and, and Dewey accepted them and brought them into Columbia University. And so they were teaching the same type of philosophy. And they brought in and indoctrinating the students with this uh, known as the uh, Hanford School, the Frankfurt School for short. Literally, members were talked about this school of Germany, this Western Marxism. And while they preferred their theory to be called the theory of society, their work has become known as uh, cultural Marxism. In harmony with Marx, the Frankfurt School theorists taught that everything in Western society is so evil, every faucet of it indeed needs to be ruthlessly criticized, weakened, and destroyed. Doesn't that what you're seeing? We gotta tear everything down. We gotta wipe out everything in America is bad. They've gone after the weaken it, to tear it apart, going after it, to destroy it. But in fact, the Marxists had failed their first and biggest test, World War I, but it wasn't enough to make them to abandon Marxism. They remained Marxist at the core and sought to, savage, uh, to literally savagely bring in Marxist vision for the, uh, the um, literally to get rid of this capitalistic system that dominated Europe, United States, and plagued the world. They had it, that's what they wanted, the, this utopia. Max Harmon defined their theory as this. The theory dominated, uh, or excuse me, Max uh, Harkenheimer defined the critical theory of society as a theory dominated at every turn by the, a concern for reasonable conditions of life. 
It was a theory which condemns existing social institutions and practices as inhuman and a theory which uh, uh, contemplates the need for alteration of society as a whole. The rise of the Nazi movement in Germany forced these professors, as I said, to flee from their German homeland. These national socialists were competing, the Marxist socialists, and the Frankfurt theorists were uh, definitely recognizable as Marxists. And they were Jewish in 1935, here it is, and forgive me if I get the date, uh, fled Germany and made Columbia University in New York their base of operations. They enjoyed the safety, the liberty, opportunities, wealth, and honor of the United States offered them during World War II. And after World War II, some of these professors Frank, uh, returned to Germany, but others stayed and indoctrinated university students with their ideals, culture revolution, and criticism. The United States has emerged from World War II as the most powerful nation in history. And taking Germany's place, they inherited the area of what those who target and harass the powerful. Of those sympathetics to Marx wars on inequality among socioeconomic classes, these culture Marxists instead focused their culture areas where people groups encounter what inequality. You ever heard of uh, social justice? It's an oxymoron. If you have justice, means justice is for all. You must judge, but social justice. No, we take those that are hampered. Man, this is exactly what you got. This is the type of what we see today. E, they so powerful inequalities in the clash of cultures where Western culture dominated none. What's, they've seen all of these things of races, it was of the European races, dominated non-European races. You know, the whites against the blacks, boy, they definitely, does it sound familiar from Barack Obama? Or religious, where people practicing various forms of Christianity, they went after it. Oppressing the people of other religions, so they went after Christianity. It's the dominant of, of America. Christianity is too dominant. It's values, it's truth. We need to deal with a family. Parents often dominate their children and adults oppress the young. So what did a society do? Look what we're doing to children. All of a sudden got some little girl telling us about ecology and that the world's ending in 12 years. All of a sudden these crazy people, man, what have they done? All of a sudden, children have vocal. Children should vote. Children should do all of these things of gender. Men often dominate women. You know, God is out of a structure of marriage, a theocracy. God would be the head. Ephesians uh, chapter 5, uh, verse 22, I believe, uh, 31, forgive me. Uh, and he would talk about this role of the husband, the role of the wife, the role of the children, that God would be the head in a the theocracy. Then man and then women would submit to men, not as a less equal, but as equals. And children that are equal with their parents, but would be submissive to them. That's a role in the home. That's the role in the church. And then a theocracy in a personal relationship, everybody submits to Christ. Christ is the head of everybody. But we see this structure being attacked. You see? So the really base this down as we've seen this uh, philosophy of progressivism. How has it attacked the church? How has it attacked the Bible? I wrote this down for you. It's American freedom versus American progressivism. And we can take a look at this now. I got to go in my notes. My notes on this part, I'm going to make sure I switch it around. I've seen an error in my typing here. You see? We believe in constructionalism. We believe it. They believe in collectivism. And collectivism is ideal that individual life belongs not to him, but to the group or society which he is merely a part of. That he has no rights and that he must sacrifice his values and goals for the group's greater good. That's socialism. They believe in collectivism. That's exactly right. We believe in individualism. They believe in conformity. You see that? 
we believe in everybody has individual rights. They believe, no, everybody conforms together. Individualism is ideal that the individual life belongs to him and that he has an ineligible, an ineligible right to live as he sees fit, to act on his own judgment, to keep and to use the product uh, of his effort and to pursue the values of his choosing. The directory that uh, defines the act of conformity as, as in accordance to established practice. That's what we are. But to conform simply means to change one's thoughts in order to comply with the rules of general customs. People tend to conform for various reasons. They may want to belong to a particular group or they may feel the need to conform because of a lack of self-reliance or beliefs to their own views to conform people. Man, I look at this disease, how it's broken out. But we've seen conformity. Simply means to change one's thoughts in order to conform to the rules of general customs. That's what it is. Individuals, man, we govern a society. We, as Americans, are sovereign. The government works for us. But collectivism, no, you work for the government. You see, we believe in private property. Progressivism doesn't. We believe in prosperity. Progressive, they believe in redistribution of wealth. We believe in separation of powers. They believe in the big administrative state. The government runs you. And you know what? This is from, um, what's his name? Man, forgive me. Uh, I'll, have to, I'll give you the name of who this person is that I got this from. We believe in eternal truths. They believe in ideological social engineering. Social engineering is a discipline in social science that refers to efforts to influence particular attitudes and social behaviors on a large scale. Whether by governments, media, private groups, in order to produce desired characteristics in a target population. What do you see today? CNBC, CNN. Even Fox News, well, they're conservative, so we know. But what about the progressive? And when you got to lie, man, it really challenges you. To, you have to choose your battles. But I can, I can tell you and dictate media does it. According to this, social engineering is a database scientific system used to develop substantial design so as to what's an archive and intellectual management of earth resources the mother earth and human capital with the highest levels of freedom prosperity and happiness within a population social man database scientific system man attacking we believe in real science as christians they believe in social science. Social, so, 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 social science is, in its broadest sense, a study of society and the manner in which people behave and influence the world around us. Social science tells us about the world beyond our immediate experience and can help explain how our society works from the cause of unemployment to what helps the economy grow, to how and why people vote, or what makes people happy. It provides virtual information for governments, policymakers, local authorities, non-government organizations, and others. What do we do? Let's take a vote on everything. We believe in the rights of man. They believe in the power of government. We believe as Christians in moral order. They believe in situational ethics. It's based on the views of the time. We believe in liberty. They believe in a growing uh, authoritarianism. And it's an, an enforcement of advocacy of structural obedience to authority at the expense of personal freedom. They believe in authoritarianism. They want to take control of everything. We believe in education. As Christians, they believe in indoctrination. Ain't that something? A.W. Tozer said this. He states that almost all of life problems 
and their solutions are theological, and that a person who comes to a right belief about God will relieve himself of many other problems in life, and that a person who has a wrong concept about God will add many other problems to his life. Just as we say, we believe in education, letting people make decisions, letting people allow to choose who they're gonna serve. They believe in indoctrination. These points that I gave you came from Mark Levine. And he's wonderful, wonderful. Uh, I feel that he's a Jewish man, but he's, uh, he's conservative. But he wrote this. And I really enjoyed him, and I thought you would enjoy him too. But I love what Tozer says to us, you guys. If we're going to believe the Bible, we believe in education, we believe in studying. They believe in tearing everything apart, indoctrinating. But A.W. Tozer said it perfectly. If we accept God and who he is, the right belief of God, we will relieve ourselves of so many problems. But the wrong view of God, you'll never create a utopia on earth. You will create people that are angry, frustrated, not giving their own way, lashing out at society. Suicides have gone insane. Terroristic threatening shootings for an ideology that can never fulfill. That's what I shared with you. This, our faith is under attack. Christians are under attack. The Bible is under attack. Your rights and freedom of speech are under attack. The Bible that we believe is under attack. Norman Geiser says this. Many forces converge from form to form liberalism and to mold its view of scripture. The diversity of the attacking views may disguise the underlying unity. Unmistakably, however, is the, uh, the commonality of the consistent and persistent anti-supernaturalism that attacks Orthodox Christianity at its core. So beautifully said. This liberalism trying to mold us with scripture, trying to constantly attack our view of the supernatural, attacking miracles, attacking this personal relationship with God, attacking Orthodox Christianity to its core. The conclusion is this, if miracles do not occur, then the Bible is unreliable and historical Christianity is not credible. On this premise, modern liberalism is then the base. Its view of scriptures then is faulty as its view of miracles. Anything outside Christianity fails. And of course, if the Bible cannot be supernatural revelation of God, there's no supernatural events. And if the Bible isn't true in its supernatural events, how do you have a virgin birth? How do you have a Messiah? How do you have God became a man? the hypostatic union. In Isaiah 55, it said this about the Bible. I want you to stand strong. I want you to believe what the Bible says. In Isaiah 55, 10 through 12, for as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and they do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out with joy and be led with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth into singing before you, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. The beauty of who God is. And one last thing in Luke. 21 verses 29 to 33, Jesus said this. Then he spoke to them in parables. Look at the fig tree and all the other trees. Look at Israel and the other nations. When, you, when they are already budding, you see and know for yourself that the summer is near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Understand this, you guys. God's word will always be attacked, but God's word 
will always stand the test of time. We can trust the Bible. We can trust who God is in these times. But be ready for attack. Be ready for the spiritual warfare that comes upon all believers. May you stand strong. I hope you enjoyed this class. There was so much on there. I didn't want to overwhelm, you know, have one week and go off somewhere. But I just wanted to stay focused on the text, and I hope you enjoyed that. Continue to grow. Continue to discover so much about God's love. I hope you enjoyed this. God bless you. Keep studying. Uh, I'll have the up in a couple days about your questions through this. But know these things. Look them up yourself. Did I lie? Ooh, that's always an education does. If you don't need to look it up, I'm indoctrinating you. I love what Pastor Rollo always said to us, you guys. Don't take my word. Look it up for yourself. May God bless you. May he keep you. And we'll see you real soon. God bless you now. Bye-bye.